as we sit here today in Prague, we are more or less on terms with the fact that we find ourselves in a historic Czech capital, in a country of the same name. Some of us may be even thinking of enjoying a pint of Czech beer. But how has it come about that we think of this country as Czech, that we think of Prague as Czech, and that we even call local beer Czech? After all, this country of the present-day Czech Republic has been for centuries a melting pot of different cultures, beliefs, and traditions, of which the Czech, German, Jewish, or Roma traditions are but some of the most dominant ones. So how is it that we think of this country as Czech? I personally, having been born in Czechoslovakia in the mid-1980s, have been drawn to this question from a very early on in my childhood, simply by having to introduce myself. You see, to many of my Czech compatriots, the name Albin, not to mention Sibera, sounds so un-Czech that some of them never took me for one. Or at least, not for an authentic one, such as a guy named Josef, or Pepa, as Czechs like to say, might be viewed. Never mind that the name Josef is of Hebrew origin, and the Czech diminutive Pepa comes most likely from Pepe, a shorter for Italian Giuseppe. So how did we get to this point? How is it that we think of a name, a city, or a beer as Czech, when so many things around us point to so many alternate names, adjectives, and definitions. When it comes to my name, I personally found an unexpected comfort in living abroad. In Canada, UK, or even today in Slovenia, not many people are surprised when I introduce myself as Albin and that I am Czech. Canadians, Britons, or Slovenes simply do not have that ready-made idea of Czech, which many Czechs do, and which seems so hard to square with my foreign-sounding name. Incidentally, it was also abroad where I first got acquainted with authors whose line of inquiry offers possible answers as to why we fall into the habit of defining our surroundings in one way despite the reality suggesting the contrary. Benedict Anderson is the author of a well-known 1970s book, Imagined Communities, in which he refers to nations as imagined communities. These communities, writes Anderson, are to be distinguished not by their falsity or genuineness, but by the style in which they are imagined. Since when, however, do we imagine ourselves as members of communities defined by specific territories, flags, and other symbols? How many of you can imagine the territory of your country in its entirety, with all the hills, rivers, towns, and borders? Isn't it much more natural to imagine yourself as a member of a family, a village, a school community, or neighborhood at best? So since when do we imagine ourselves as members of specific nations? Anderson offers a very invigorating account of how print, together with the rise of literacy and secularism, facilitated the spread of written news, stories, and histories in vernacular languages. Thus, by early 19th century, interpreting past through German, Czech, or Italian perspectives was a very novel and, in a way, very emancipatory approach, usually undertaken by local elites. Israeli historian Shlomo Sand writes that these 19th century intellectuals, journalists, linguists, other writers, in case of the Czech Republic, one such dominant figure is František Palacký, 
Some of you are to encounter this person on a Czech thousand crown bill, which can get you around decently around Prague beer gardens, but better bring more Palatsky notes if you are into margaritas and other fancy drinks. So these 19th century intellectuals, bright sand, painted melancholy landscapes, invented, invented moving folk tales and gigantic historical heroes. They were taking events related to diverse and unconnected political entities. They welded them into a coherent narrative, unifying time and space, thus producing long national histories stretching back to primeval times. Wandering around Prague and one of its major hallmarks, the Old Town Square, you cannot miss the Jan Hus monument standing in the middle of the square. The monument contains inscriptions such as wish truth to everyone, invoking Jan Hus's legacy of preferring the death by burning at the stake in 1415, over renouncing his teaching, criticizing the moral corruption of the late medieval Catholic Church. How much of this, however, is the production of 19th and 20th century authors and artists to whom Palatsky's interpretation of Jan Hus served as the ultimate starting point? And how much is left of the real Jan Hus of the 15th century? If you think this is not enough of Hussite history in town, you are welcome to venture further afield and discover yet more of this. Czech National Memorial, located at the Vítkov Hill, just above the main train, st main train station, contains one of the largest statues of its kind. Overlooking the city from a hilltop, the statue is supposed to symbolize the, the battle during Vyžiška and handful of his soldiers, together with lay folk, including women and children, thwarted the crusaders trying to capture Prague in 1420. For decades, conscripts of the Czechoslovak and later Czech army have been sworn in at this venue, invoking the, the, the battle uh, symbolizing the Czech bravery and will to fight when faced with greater, superior, and often German enemy. That is at least a gist of a story which significantly lags behind what reality might have looked like and where a skirmish at the Vítkov Hill might have occurred. However, it almost certainly had no effect on the Crusaders, who retreated after the heir to the Czech throne, Sigismund, had been crowned a Bohemian king. Palatsky's nascent work in 19th century historiography very much defined the perception of the Czech history for the next two centuries and ensured that Hussite movement, together with their epic battles, became one of the central chapters of the Czech narratives produced by authors and artists for generations to come. However, as contemporary Czech historian Petr Czorny asks, how many of these narratives would have been narrated the way they are had Palatsky been born to a Catholic family and not a Protestant family? How much of the sentiment for the struggle of the Hussites against Catholicism would have been felt had Palatsky himself been Catholic? Would he still construct the narration identifying Czechs as those fighting the Germans and medieval Catholicism? While we will never know the precise answer, we should not stop asking ourselves questions such as these. Not least of all, because 19th century historiography very much defined the way we imagine the Czech identity today, as well as the way many of the Czech 20th century statesmen imagine it. And many of their successors continue to do so until today. These days, we frequently listen to politicians appealing to their voters by allegedly defending Czech traditions and Czech identity. However, we only have very vague definitions of these traditions. Save for the existence of perhaps the Czech language, which itself is riddled with German, Italian, or Yiddish words. More often than not, politicians tend to exploit the fact that historical stories are well known among general public, who, of course, are their potential Voters. If we look at the stories of the collective imagination 
as social constructs. As Canadian philosopher Ian Hacking observes, we, in the first place, liberate ourselves from preconceived notions and stereotypes. We do not necessarily have to take apart all the Czech stories just because they are social constructs. A well-known, a popular Slovenian philosopher, Slavoj Žižek, points out that various efforts of nationalist movements, of returning to the origins, is in fact a product of, it, of itself. It only relates to the effort itself. And on top of that, I can personally assure you that it is absolutely safe to run around with a Czech passport or a Czech identity card, and your name does not have to be Pepa, or Jan, or Honza, as Czechs like to say, undoubtedly invoking the German Huns in them. Thank you for your attention.